I'm loving it. Are you loving it? Yeah, you know you loving it. And if you're loving it, you can't get enough of it. Put a hand high, right where the other is. For the week, but can't find that quitter with me. It's that bit of sweet literature that Lydia streets walk with the Prince of Peace. See what he's for. Hey, this is Dr. K from my medical school, and today we're going to do the response to the original case report we posted about nausea, vomiting, hypotension, and hypoglycemia. Before we get to the response, let's just do a brief review of the actual case, and then we'll move on to the diagnoses and treatment. So we had Mr. H, a 55-year-old male with a past medical history of end-stage renal disease, status post cadaveric renal transplant in both 2005 and 2007. He also has a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and multiple small bowel obstructions in 2006, 2009, and 2010. He presents with nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, hypoglycemia, and hypotension. From this right away, we know because of his cadaveric renal transplant, he's immunocompromised. Now let's move on to the next part of the history. We're told that Mr. H started feeling fatigued about 10 days prior to admission. As the days progressed, he noticed worsening para-umbilical and epigastric abdominal pain with radiation to his back. He notes he has felt warm with occasional chills at times, but never took his temperature. He started developing nausea with accompanied vomiting. His episodes of emesis are non-bloody and tend to be triggered by oral intake. He has not eaten any food in the past eight days, only taking in very small amounts of water. He denies any chest pain, which does not mean that he's not having a heart attack, shortness of breath, skin changes, or urinary symptoms. His symptoms worsened, and his family became increasingly concerned. So one night, they called 911. The squad came and noted he had a systolic blood pressure of 75 and a blood glucose of 45. He was started on intravenous fluids and was given an amp of D50, then rushed to the ER. In terms of his past medical history, he has end-stage renal disease, status post-cadaveric renal transplant times 2, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and multiple small bowel obstructions. Past surgical history include those transplants, his no known drug allergies, medications include metoprolol 50 BID, Lipitor 40 Q day, hydralazine 25 mg QID, prednisone 10 mg every other day, and sinicalcet 60 mg once a day. Family history consists of a mother who has diabetes and a stroke at age 70, father with diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and a brother with an MI status post cabbage. In terms of his social history, he cuts lumber for a living, has done so since he was 18, drinks three to four beers a month, denies use of chewing tobacco, regular alcohol use or illicits. Temperature is about 100.2 degrees Fahrenheit, blood pressure is 90 by 65, respirations are 22 and a heart rate of 110. He's lethargic but oriented and in no acute distress. Tachycardic with irregular rhythm, no murmurs, rubs, or gallops. Lungs show decreased breath sounds at the bases. His abdomen soft, protuberant, but not but tender only in the epigastric and paraumbilical areas on palpation. Bowel sounds are present. There's no rebound tenders and no ecchymoses are present. He has a fissure in the left upper extremity with good flow. So if we had to sum up this case in about one sentence, it would look something like this. Mr. H, a 55-year-old male with a past medical history of end-stage renal disease, status post cadaveric renal transplant times 2 with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and small bowel obstructions, who presented with nausea, non-bloody emesis, and para-umbilical slash epigastric abdominal pain, radiating to the back with hypertension and hypoglycemia. Clearly, this patient is very complicated, so we need to separate out their diagnoses by signs and symptoms. So let's start off with hypotension. When you're talking about hypotension, you need to think about infection, especially in an immunocompromised patient. Also think about adrenal insufficiency in someone who's been on constant or chronic steroids. Think about blood loss and then vasculature abnormalities as well. In terms of infection, you want to obtain a CBC, get blood cultures to rule out bacteremia, UA urine culture to rule out UTI, as well as sputum culture to rule out uh, possible pneumonia, and obtain a chest x-ray to see if there's an infiltrate present. Actually, a pretty comprehensive workup for infection. In terms of adrenal insufficiency, so adrenal insufficiency is when you're on steroids and then your adrenal glands are not producing enough of the, their natural steroid to keep your blood pressure up during stressful situations. So if a patient does not respond to fluids and have a history of steroids, you know, always go to stress dose steroids or hydrocortisone. Um, 
What you can do is do a cosentropin stimulation test. Note the dexamethasone doesn't interfere with that, but hydrocortisone will. In terms of blood loss, you want to obtain a CBC. So one, it will help obtain a leukocytosis for infection. Two, look at anemia. Three, you also want to obtain an abdominal ultrasound to help you look for an abdominal aortic aneurysm um, that may be actively growing or that may have ruptured. Um, CT scan would also be useful as well. Um, and you can actually give this patient IV contrast because you can always run them in dialysis. But in the end, you need to place this patient a broad spectrum antibiotics kind of right away, even before you get your labs back. In terms of abdominal pain radiating to the back, that's kind of a broad differential. So patients who are end-stage renal disease, um, elderly, will present atypically. So you want to get an EKG and troponin just to make sure you're not missing anything. But you need to realize that troponin, you got to be careful with that. This patient with end-stage renal disease, their troponin may just be elevated because they can't clear that enzyme and not because they're actually having infarct present. So keep that in mind. So if it's like minorly elevated, like if your normal is 0.11 or less and it's like 0.12, this may just be what's called troponin leak from non-clearance or from sepsis and not really an MI occurring. Pancreatitis and biliary obstructions of hepatitis is always a consideration. Get a hepatic function panel. Look at total bilirubin, your liver function tests. Um, obtain a lipase and amylase and then a right upper quadrant ultrasound and again an abdominal ultrasound as well to look at that vasculature in your stomach. Gastritis and gastric such duodenal ulcers are also, also a consideration especially with the change in abdominal pain with um, PO intake, oral intake. So you can always chart the patient on the PPI with really no worries. In terms of small bowel obstruction, obtain an abdominal x-ray too. And that can also help you know, identify other pathology that could be causing this patient's abdominal pain as well. The next sign slash symptom would be hypoglycemia. It's a little bit more tricky. So hypoglycemia can be seen commonly in many different uh, chronic conditions. Uh, End-stage renal disease can be one of them. Um, infection can be one. You usually get hyperglycemia, but you can get hypo. Usually those go away with time. As the patient gets better, the hypoglycemia results. Malnutrition, huge in patients with end-stage renal disease. Uh, commonly, they lose a lot of protein, um, and they just don't eat as well. They don't have the drive to eat. So always check a pre-albumin to see their nutritional status. And the physical exam will also indicate their nutritional status as well. Adrenal insufficiency can also be a very common cause of hypoglycemia. So again, you can do the cosentropin stimulation test, um, and you can always stress dose uh, steroid them if they need it. Um, always consult endo also would be another consideration as well. Then surreptitious use of insulin. So, so if they falsely give themselves insulin. Um, you can check an insulin, a C-peptide, a pro-insulin, and sulfonylurea screen. Now there's always consideration of insulinoma, but that's very rare. Again, consider it in the back of your head, but it's very rare. So what would you expect for surreptitious insulin? You would see expect a high insulin level, a low C-peptide level, because C-peptide is produced when you have naturally producing insulin. The pro-insulin level will also be low. So pro-insulin is that protein that is produced our precursor of regular insulin. So the part of it gets cleaved and gets converted into regular insulin. And then a sulfonylurea screening is be positive with surreptitious insulin. For an insulinoma, your insulin level would be high, your C-peptide level would be high, and your pro-insulin level would be high because your body is producing too much insulin. Your sulfonylurea screen should be negative. If that were the case, you need to do a fasting study where you check sugars while a patient is fasting to see if they have hypoglycemia. All right, this brings us to the bonus question of what medications you would stop. So the medications that I probably would stop would be hydralazine and metoprolol, both of those because... This patient is, for all intents and purposes, septic. Um, so I don't want to give them anything that's going to drop their blood pressure or heart rate even more. So I'd get rid of those two medications. Lipitor would be another consideration, especially if their liver function test came back um, very high. So in that situation, I'd probably stop the Lipitor as well. Either way, it's really not necessary. You can just restart it on discharge. Really won't affect anything unless they're having an active MI because Lipitor or statins help reduce inflammation in active myocardial infarctions or heart attacks. I would also start the patient on, on stress dose steroids and stop their prednisone. So this is a brief review of the diagnoses as well as the initial workup for this patient. There are clearly some things you do with this patient down the line that may be missing from what I covered here, but it looks like your guys' responses were pretty comprehensive and pretty spot on. 
since I get a good response, I'll probably continue these cases kind of periodically and, and we'll see how you guys do. If you have any cases that you guys like, let me know. So if you like this video, give it a like. You know, Make sure to share this video with your friends on Google+, Facebook, as well as Twitter. Um, place any comments down below um, or any questions about this video or what I kind of did for my workup. Most importantly, subscribe. You can also check out the podcast at iMedical School on iTunes. This is Dr. K, and I'll see you next time.